So in our time over the last number of weeks, what we've been studying here, for those of you either that are a guest today or maybe you're a special guest with, as uh, one of our Kingdom Come partners, we've really been diving into this idea of God being a relational God. Uh, A.W. Tozer said in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, the very opening lines after a prayer, he said that whatever you think about when you think about God, whatever comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Ultimately, we need to have a right understanding of who God is so that we don't have this broken view in terms of our relationship with God. And we can do that in theological terms, talking about God's transcendence and talking about God's imminence and talking about all these things that we should talk about. But for many people, that can still feel distant. It can still feel far away. And so what we want people to understand and what we want together to understand is that God is a relational God. And so we've been looking at that through a a number of different lenses. And in fact, we have, even in the context of everything that we've been talking about, have been looking all the way back, at least glimpses, not as the main passage of Scripture, but we've been looking back to the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 because we learn a lot about God from the very outset of the revelation of Scripture. Right when we see the opening of Scripture and we see God beginning to be revealed to us, we see some things about God that we need to pay attention to. Things like God loves, things like God feels, God comes, God speaks. We can actually see some of that from the very first page of Scripture in the opening book of Genesis. But what we also see in the opening kind of verses and first chapter of the book of Genesis is we see what God does. God brings order out of chaos. It's a beautiful picture, actually, because God does that, and he starts setting things in motion and creating everything out of nothing. But when we begin to fast forward through the context of Genesis and we see the progressive revelation to those people of who God is, we start seeing them understand God in different ways. We get to a man named Abraham eventually, and Abraham, things are seemingly going pretty well. There's a lot that God is entrusting to Abraham, and Abraham is trusting God by faith. And ultimately what happens is when we come to the end of chapter 21, Abraham, it says, is basically staying in the land of the Philistines for a long time. In other words, things feel pretty settled. It's like there has been order that has been brought. God has made a promise to Abraham. Remember, Abraham and Sarah couldn't have children. God gives to them the promise because he said to Abraham in Genesis 12, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless the world through you, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you, and all of the nations of the world are going to be blessed through you. And Abraham and Sarah scratching their heads, how could this be? Eventually, God makes that promise come to life in the person of Isaac. And so now Abraham is in Philistia and he is dwelling there, the scripture says, for a really long time. And then we get to Genesis chapter 22. And the God who we see in the book of Genesis early on, the God that brings order out of chaos, now in Genesis chapter 22 brings chaos into the midst of order. Not exactly what we were hoping for, It's not exactly what we think of, but we may have to ask the question, why would God, who initially showed us in the creation narrative that he brings order out of chaos, why would God bring chaos into the midst of Abraham's order? Well, there was a reason for that. There were probably many reasons for that, but one such reason that at least we know from this passage of scripture in Genesis 22 is because God wanted to teach Abraham something else about who he was that he is a God who provides. That's what he wanted to help Abraham see and by extension that he wants us to be able to see as well. Now, it's a comfort for us to know that God provides, isn't it? I mean, is it not? It's a comfort to know that God is a God who provides. The only thing with that is this. It is a little bit uncomfortable getting to the place where we know that that's true. Is that fair? I don't know if you've been to, uh, you know, theme park, Disney World, any of those places, wherever. But like Disney, for instance, they've got this monorail. You ever been on any, anybody know what I'm talking about? All right. It's, uh, it's, it's great, you know, and particularly when you're there with people that are older than you. If they're, you know, if they're chronologically gifted in any way, shape, or form, they usually end up after the day talking about how much they enjoyed the monorail. We got to ride that monorail. That was great. It was comfortable, there was no bumps on it, and it got us where we were trying to go. Well, that's because the monorail is actually designed 
with the destination in mind. The monorail is designed to get you in a comfortable, safe, secure environment to transfer you to the destination. In fact, the monorail is built with the destination in mind. That's actually the goal of it. But that is contrasted to when you're at maybe Disney and you get on Space Mountain, which is this big roller coaster in the dark under a dome, exactly what humans should not be doing, right? And so you get in that and it, it just freaks you out. Here's the thing. The roller coaster is not built with the destination in mind. That's not why it's designed. It's designed for the ride, right? You end up somewhere, right? You end up finishing the ride, but the finish of the ride, who cares, right? This, this was not built for the destination. It was built for the ride. I think when it comes to this idea of God being the God who provides, oftentimes we have an expectation of God that we are going to live a monorail existence. That normal for our minds is that we're in this monorail life where everything should be safe and secure and comfortable and not bumpy and we can just get off going, well, okay, great. We have made it from point A to point B. Everything seems to be good. And that seems to be the way. I don't think that's the way it is with God, actually. I think the way that God operates in our lives where he brings incredible order into the midst of the chaos of our lives but also will interrupt the order, so-called, that we have in our lives to bring chaos in is because maybe God views this journey of him being provider more like a roller coaster, that this is actually about the ride. God knows the destination, but this is actually about the ride. Because you and I both know when you get on a roller coaster, oftentimes you are calling out God's name. No one on a monorail is saying, help me, Jesus. No one is doing that. You're in a seat, just going, talking to one another. Hey, how's it going? Did you enjoy that? How's the parking lot? You get on a roller coaster, and all of a sudden, right, you know God well. You see, this is the idea of how God kind of trains us, so to speak, to learn that he is the one who provides. It's a part of our existence. And we see that in the life of Abraham. And when we trust God, there are a number of things that happen. When we trust in the God who provides, we're going to see in Genesis chapter 22 that there are a few things that happen in our lives. And I want us to just point them out, take a moment to understand them a little bit, because I think what this will do is it will encourage us and it will challenge us. And that's what I want to see happen today. So the first thing that happens, I would suggest to you out of Genesis chapter 22, is that when we trust the God who provides, he will test the authenticity of that trust. So when we take the opportunity to say, God, we are trusting in you, the God who provides, he is going to test the authenticity of our trust. Uh, now, I want you to look with me in Genesis chapter 22. We're going to look at the first 12 verses. We'll actually look at uh, the better part of this entire story with Abraham and his son Isaac. And it says this, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Remember that word. And he said to, he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I go, while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. 
Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now, take a deep breath, all right? Because whenever you read this story, you just start going, man. Now, uh, what I want us to understand in this is that when, whenever we choose to trust the God who provides, and we'll see this in the life of Abraham, what God will do, the God who provides, will end up testing the authenticity of our faith. You noticed when we began to read Genesis chapter 22 that it said sometime later, God tested Abraham, right? He tested Abraham. Now, I don't want you to be confused with the fact that testing and tempting are two different things. These are not the same thing. First of all, we know from scripture that God never tempts anyone because God himself cannot be tempted. But God clearly tests. And he is testing Abraham here. Now you say, Jerry, okay, help me. Because whenever I think of these terms, I think of them the same. I think of testing and tempting kind of the same way. Listen, tempting is for the purpose of ultimately leading you to failure. Testing is for the purpose of ultimately strengthening your trust in God. Tempting is what leads you toward failure. Testing is what leads you toward God. Think of it in those terms. It is kind of the the negative and positive poles of what we see when we see testing versus tempting. And so there's there's no tempting that's going on here. There's only testing. How many of you have ever felt like you have been tested by God? Raise your hand. Okay, Uh, some of you haven't. I don't even know what that means. Except to say you will be, if you're new on this journey, you will be. And it tests the authenticity of our faith. Now, have you, you, those of you who've ever been tested, in this room or watching, uh, you know, in our East Worship Center or watching at one of our campuses there at Lockport or online. How many of you have ever felt this way? Have you ever felt like the God who is trying to save you is also trying to kill you? Is any, am I the only one or is it, have you ever felt that way where you just, you go, man, the God who's trying to save me is trying to kill me. Now, I was reading about some of the training that uh, Navy SEALs do after I got out, um, I was just looking at what they do now, <laughs> nowadays, back, you know, because it's much easier now than when I was in. But <clears throat> I, don't, I don't even know why you're laughing. <laughs> because you can't hide this. And this is just it's what it is, like in front of you, every bam, it's like there all the time. So the Navy SEALs, they, they do a lot, and they are obviously cared for and and accidents do happen from time to time, extraordinarily rare in any training that military is doing. But, and so there are both military experts and medical experts that are on site when the Navy SEALs are training, but they do a lot of things, including some of the water um, tests that they do are extraordinary, uh, to say the least, in terms of how they're tested. And I was reading about how one of those, you know, scenarios where one, one of the candidates to become a SEAL actually said to the commanding officer there, sir, are you trying to kill me? To which the commanding officer responded, no, I'm trying to save you. That ultimately what I'm doing here is going to help me see whether A, you've got what it takes to do what's necessary, and this is also going to help save your life. Also was reading about some Shepherds in the Middle East, there's uh, a few people that are here with us today uh, who are partners of ours who know a thing or two about this. Uh, There are very few of us who know anything about this. But there was a shepherd who was actually trying to care for his sheep who had had gotten an infestation. Uh, I don't know if it was bugs or whatever it was. And so he had to actually take the sheep and put them in an entire like kind of vat of antiseptic and in doing it the sheep are thinking to themselves some of them are basically kicking and screaming because he has to put their entire heads under water 
The shepherd is doing this, putting their heads underneath. I mean, it had to get in their ears and everything. And he's put, and they're looking at him like, you, you're the only one we trust. You're the one whose voice we listen to, and now you're going to drown us? Now you're going to kill us? But the shepherd was actually helping them was actually helping to save their life. And it was interesting as I was looking through and thinking through some of this that there was a sheep or two who would just stare at the shepherd and not fight as they would be put underneath this antiseptic to, to get all the infestation out, whatever it was that was kind of attacking the sheep. And they would just look like, okay, I know I'm in your hands. I don't know what you're doing here, but okay. And it also said something to the shepherd. He kind of noticed which sheep were doing that and which sheep weren't doing that. And so ultimately, when God is testing us, he is doing so because it's, it's testing the authenticity of our faith. And for Abraham here in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham had a promise right in front of his face. Not just a promise theoretically, like God saying, hey, I'm going to do this for you at some point. No, God had, had said, I'm going to give you a child, and, and I'm going to bless you. And, and even though you and Sarah don't have any children, there's one coming. And I know you're extraordinarily old, and Sarah's biological clock has already detonated like decades ago. I know that, but I'm still going to do this for you. And there's Isaac right in front of Abraham. There he is. And they're just hanging out, living where they're living. Everything seems to be peaceful. And then God says, you know that promise that I made, for, made to you about Isaac and how I'm going to rescue the world and bless the world through your line and Isaac is living proof of that? Yeah, you know that promise? I want you to kill that promise. Could you imagine that? I want you to kill that promise. Now, before you jump off the God train here and go, I will never listen to a God who's about child sacrifice. Listen, what we're seeing in the book of Genesis is a progressive revelation of the nature of who God is. And what we learn very soon uh, after that is that God abhors these types of things. He abhors child sacrifice. But you need to understand something. Even though this seems very sensitive to our ears and our minds and our eyes and our hearts, it wasn't something that was foreign to Abraham. Abraham was living in the context with a bunch of pagan deities all around him where child sacrifice was the norm. This wasn't something that was unheard of, something that he would go, wow, I've never even thought about this. In fact, if you were thinking about it, you would know that God had actually put a premium on the firstborn anyway. And you would know a little bit later on, both in, in Exodus chapter 22 and Numbers chapter 3, that God said the firstborn is mine, not for sacrifice, but for service. That ultimately this is what God was doing. He was saying, I, I want the firstborn, it's mine. And Abraham also knew, as this ancient people did, that there was an understanding that there was a debt that was owed to deity. Both in the pagan context and in the early Israeli context, they understood this. And they looked at it almost as a sin debt, where either A, from a pagan standpoint, they're offering their firstborn, or B, from an Israelite standpoint, because God abhors that type of thing, they're offering their child in service to the Lord. So this wasn't something that was foreign to Abraham's ears like it is to ours. Now, if God would have said, I want you to kill your wife, I think Abraham would have thought he's hallucinating. No, no, God couldn't have said that. That's, that's completely no. I don't know what that's all about. But when he said, your son, your firstborn, your only son, now remember he's talking about the son of promise, because some of you are going, what about Ishmael? He's talking about the son of promise here. And so this wasn't foreign to him, but, so Abraham wasn't so freaked out about what God said, but I think Abraham must have been incredibly freaked out about the implications of what God said. Now there's obviously the emotional tie up when you're a father, but here's what God was saying to Abraham, listen to this, do you trust the provider more than you trust the promise? Some of you are going, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't really separate the two. No, you can't. But think about this. Abraham realized in a moment, because God is the one who gave the promise of Isaac, and God is the one who gave the command to kill the promise. What do you do when God's command and God's promise are at odds? That's a tough position for Abraham to be in, isn't it? And some of us have trouble even processing that. In fact, listen to how the writer of Hebrews reflects on the nature of Abraham and what he's going through in Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to what he says. 
By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Do you see even there that the writer of Hebrews is talking about this conundrum? God's the one who gave the command. God's the one who gave the promise. I don't know how to rectify those things in my head, but Abraham acted in faith. He trusted that the very God who is just and holy and will do whatever he said, if it's his command, then he will follow through, is also the God who will fulfill his promise. And Abraham probably didn't completely understand how a God who is holy and just is going to fulfill his command and fulfill his promise at the same time when he said, I want you to kill the promise, right? I don't know how he's gonna put all of that together, but Abraham trusted God. He trusted, listen, more than the promise, he trusted the provider who stands behind the promise even more. This is significant for us, ladies and gentlemen. You say, well, man, I'm glad this doesn't have anything to do with me. I think it does have something to do with us because even though our context is very different, God's not gonna ask you to put to death a child. He really wasn't ultimately getting at that. He was, this was a part of the test in his own sovereignty and we learn later on, God abhors that type of thing. That that would make Israel very distinct from all of the pagan nations that were around her. But what does God do in our context today? Well, let me ask you a question. Is there some times possibly when maybe you trust and maybe you, you embrace God's promises at the expense of really loving and serving and trusting the provider who stands behind those promises. For instance, here in the United States, for all of you folks that are international that are here with us, here in the United States, just about everybody, not everybody, but just about everybody believes in heaven. You can talk to just about anybody you wanna talk to And just about everybody in the world, you know, in our context here, they believe in heaven. Now, many of them just say, no, I don't really believe there's a hell, but, you know, I just, I believe there's a heaven. It's kind of like, yeah, Jesus is, he only knows half the time what he's talking about, right? Um, So they believe in this concept, right, of heaven. Here's the problem, is that oftentimes the discussion, even sometimes among those who, who claim that they are faithful followers of Christ, their conversation about heaven is totally bankrupt of God. Their idea is, I just can't wait, everything's gonna be good and everything's gonna be fun and everything's gonna be cool and now I'll just get to hang out with my friends and do all this kind of stuff. And you hear people, some who are clearly not followers of Christ and some who are followers, but ultimately what happens in their world is they just, they think about a heaven and they conceptualize and talk about this promise that's true. They talk about this promise, but ultimately they talk about it without God involved. A heaven without God is hell. You don't even understand conceptually what a heaven might be without God involved. And so sometimes we might cling to these promises that God has made of what's to come, but we trust those more than we actually trust the provider of the very thing that we're talking about. How about with material need? We love to hear Jesus tell us, give and it will be given unto you. And so we we get to a place where maybe God has abundantly blessed us, maybe he has met every need, he has provided for everything and then some, and we have gotten to the place where we actually trust in the stuff more than the provider of the stuff. Or maybe we just enjoy that promise so much and we get lost in it as if it's a formula and we lose sight of the God who sometimes will come into the midst of what we think we've got control of and ordered of and he will mess with 
and make chaotic our order just so he can remind us that this is ultimately about relationship with God. It is not about relationship with theory. It is not even about solely relationship with promise. It is about the God who stands behind the promises. That's what makes the promises so precious. So, what God will do when we trust in him is he will test the authenticity of our faith. So Abraham had to trust that the provider could reconcile. The provider could reconcile somehow being just to fulfill his command and being faithful to his promise. And that's where the ram came in. We'll read that in just a second. That a ram was provided, and so a ram was sacrificed in the place of Isaac. And so God still fulfilled this promise of sacrifice, fulfilled this command of sacrifice, and fulfilled this promise of how he was going to bless the world. And it points us to the cross, does it not? Because we begin to ask the question, if God is a holy God and he says he is going to judge sin, and that we will stand in judgment, and that the wages of sin is death, that God has done that. Yet God has also promised that there can be reconciliation to him. How does that happen? It only happens through his son, Jesus, who, who put the wood on his shoulders like Isaac did, and went to a hill, and gave his life for the sin of mankind, so that the justice of God and the promise of God could meet at the cross. This is a picture. See, here's what we've got to remember. When we trust the God who provides, he's going to test the authenticity of that trust. But he's also going to do something else. Second thing, when we trust the God who provides, he won't often let us see our, the provision in advance. This is, as I read this story, it dawned on me more and more. Oftentimes, what we know God to be, we know God to be a God who provides. In fact, listen, after, after Abraham is raising the knife to slay his son, then the scripture says, God intervenes and says, don't lay a hand on him. And then verse 13 says this, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. You see, in just the previous chapter, when we realize that Abraham is living in the land of Philistia for a long time and everything seems, seems to be nice and settled, do you know what God had revealed himself to be in that context? Uh, listen to it. It's in, it's in Genesis chapter 21. You can probably look at the page to the left real quick. It says, Abraham planted a tamarisk, uh, tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, El Olam, the eternal or enduring God. Do you know what God was revealing himself as? The God who deals with the long term. The God of the long term. And you know what God is doing now when we get to the story of Abraham and Isaac? He's saying, I'm not only the God of the long term who's got it all taken care of, but I'm also the God of the, the immediate need. Because that place he called the Lord will provide. That's the place there at Moriah that he called the Lord will provide. That translated actually means the Lord sees. That's the idea of, of what is said when it talks about the Lord will provide. The Lord sees. You see, for us, this is really important because let's just say, for instance, that we got in a hot air balloon and we had the opportunity to watch this event unfold. We're there in the mountain area of Moriah, Moriah. And we are, we're in a hot air balloon and we're watching this unfold and Abraham and Isaac are mic'd up and we've got opportunity to listen to it there in the hot air balloon. And so we hear them as they're leaving. And as they're leaving, we hear Isaac say to Abraham, Father, where, where's, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham tells him, God himself is going to provide that. So you, Isaac puts the wood up on him, and Abraham takes the other stuff, and they start making their way. And here they come. We're up here in the balloon. And we're seeing them as they're walking. And we think that something's wrong with our microphone because there's just not a lot of talking. 
It's a sober moment. I mean, you could imagine, right? Abraham walking with his son, Abraham knowing what he's been called to do, Isaac a little bit in the dark about it, Abraham not talking much, therefore Isaac probably not talking much. We don't know exactly how old Isaac was, but he was old enough. And they're walking. And we see them as we're way up here looking down on this mount. We see them walking up this side. And for every step they're taking, there's a ram on the other side of the mountain that they can't see that's taking a step at every step they're taking. They have no idea. But we do because we're looking down on it. They make their way and still not a lot of conversation, but every step that they take, the ram is taking those steps on the other side, only to the place where Isaac is bound up now and Abraham is raising the knife toward the sky to do what God called him to do until God interrupts and says, here is what I have provided. You see, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. Most of the time, when we trust in the God who provides, he doesn't often show us the provision in advance. But here's the good news. You might want to jot this down just principally. We don't have to see the provision because we know the provider sees us. We don't have to see the provision. We know the provider sees us. See, I don't know what circumstance you may be facing, but whatever that circumstance is, here's what you can know. When you trust in the God who provides, the provider sees you. That's why Abraham called this place, the Lord will provide, or the Lord sees. He knows what our need is. And by the way, for every need that you have, God probably has a name. Because he's revealed himself over and over and over again as a God who meets every need that we have. And it's not so important if we don't see it right now. Some of you are going, man, I've got a pressing need. Maybe that pressing need is financial. Maybe that pressing need is relational. Maybe that pressing need is health related. Whatever it might be. You're saying, I don't know, I, I, I can't see it. Here's the thing, you aren't supposed to see it. You're supposed to trust the provider because he sees you. He loves you. Now, might we, might we go through life sometimes not completely and totally understanding? Um, yes. A lot, in fact. But here's what we can trust. We can trust that the God that we trust, he provides and he is good. Let me give you a last thing that I see in this story. When we trust the God who provides, he will make us an instrument of his provision. When we trust the God who provides, he'll make us an instrument of his provision. I want you to look in verse 15, after Abraham proclaims this, the place called the, the Lord will provide, then it says in verse 15, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Isn't this incredible? Do you know what happened here with Abraham is it actually got, ta it got taken one step further than what God had said and what Job had said actually to God. Remember Job talking about you give and you take away. But here with Abraham, here's what happened. You give, you take away, you give back. It's really an incredible thing that happens here. But understand this, when God gave Isaac back to Abraham, although in that moment, that was certainly for, for Abraham and for Isaac, and it made a tremendous difference emotionally in every other way, that here he comes, he's back. He was as good as dead, and he's back. And Abraham was even trusting, as we read Hebrews, that even if he had slain him, that he felt like God would raise him. 
because he trusted. He didn't know how God was going to do this, how God was going to honor his command and honor his promise at the same time, but he trusted in the provider. And so in that, he gave him back to Abraham, but it wasn't just for Abraham that God provided. God's provision for Abraham was his provision for the world. It wasn't just for Abraham. And you see, the same thing is true for us. What we have to recognize in this story is that when we trust the God who provides, he is going to ultimately make us an instrument of his provision. Now, in the moment when God provides for us, in the moment, it feels like it's just for us. And here's the great news. God loves us in such a deep way that it is for us, that God does provide for us. But the intent of God's provision in your life is not solely for you. It is for others as well. In fact, I think we get to see this in a lot of different scenarios in the body of Christ. So when a family goes through death or disease of a child, I have watched time and time again how other people in the family of God who have gone through the same thing who God has provided for everything they need emotionally and spiritually and otherwise and has helped bring healing into their world, that those people are now coming alongside people going through the same thing and are now being used as an instrument of God's provision. That when God provided for them through their trial and through their tragedy, it was for them, but it wasn't just for them, it was also for the way he wanted to make them an instrument of his provision in someone else's life. I have watched when people have gone through the difficulty of divorce. They have been abandoned and they have been left. And they are struggling and they are hurting, yet God comes in and he meets them right where they are and he begins to heal them and bring them everything that they need in this process. And then I see those same people standing alongside other people who are now going through the same thing and they have been provided for and now are an instrument of provision in other people's lives. People who have had cancer, who have walked through this and watched as God has given them everything they need through the course of this dark, dark journey. And then as God brings them through, they are now standing next to and encouraging and helping people who are walking in that very dark tunnel of existence right now because when God provided for them, it wasn't just for them, it was also for others. You see, when we trust the God who provides, he will make us an instrument of his provision. And it's not just true emotionally and spiritually, it's also true tangibly. I told you guys uh, last year sometime, related to our kingdom come giving, that God had done a work in my own heart and had spoken to me very clearly about what he had intended for me to do in this year. It was a struggle for me, because when I, I didn't think I heard God right at first, so I took some time to debate with myself. So our kingdom come giving is that which we give above and beyond kind of our systematic, regular giving. So I, I've always been beyond a tither in our regular systematic giving. That's part of kind of how God's wired me and what I want to honor God with and be a person of generosity. It was instilled in me at a young, young age when I first came to know Christ, and I've honored that in my life. But our kingdom come giving is when we trust God for that which is above and beyond our regular giving and saying, God, if you provide it, then we'll give it. We're trusting you. God, if you'll provide it, we'll give it. And so, you know, the previous year, we, we had a, a very um, robust giving to kingdom come that we said, God, if you'll provide it, we'll give it. And we were thrilled. And it, you know, it was a challenge. We were just like, okay, God, how are you gonna do this? But do it, and he did it, and it's great. And so I'm praying over this past year, 
God, what, are you, what do you have for me to do in kingdom come? I'm yours, whatever you want to do. And I mean, I, as clear as I'm standing here talking with you, God said to me, double it. And I was like, you mean like, you, do you mean like, um, I knew there was a no to do you mean like anything. I'm just trying to buy some time trying to make sure does God really know what he's talking about because I'm thinking I got a kid who's going to college here pretty soon I don't know how that's going to be possible so I I did what any husband would do because I was kind of alone when I felt God saying that to me I did not immediately take it to my wife <laughs> and instead waited about a month and a half as I thought through it and processed and prayed and thinking, God, did you really just say this to me? And of course, then I started asking myself some questions. Well, who else do you think said it to you? You think the devil said it to you? Yeah, we want to free up more money so that you'll trust God and do. No, he didn't say it to me. Do you think you said it to yourself? Clearly not. <laughs> Clearly not. So who do you think said it to you? I think you did, Lord. Okay, are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? What's so I talked to Edie about it, and right when I told her, I said, you know, I'm, we gotta talk about and kind of pray through what God wants us to do this year in our kingdom come giving. She's like, yeah, yeah, what are you thinking? <laughs> well, well, I'm actually not thinking. I'm actually listening, and I'm actually petrified. And so I told her, and she went, her exact words, what? I said, that's what I said. Maybe you wanna talk to him and see if maybe. <laughs> Maybe something's changed, maybe. I don't know. And so then she, I can just see it written all over her face. And the thing is, I honor what was written all over her face because it was written all over my face and all over my heart for a while. But she finally comes around to saying, if we think this is what God is saying, then okay, we'll trust him. Well, we're almost... We're almost to the end of the line with this past year, and God's provided. He's provided. And we've given, and God's been faithful. I don't know how else to say it, but here's the thing. God didn't do that just to provide for me. God did it because I had the opportunity, as many of you, to release what God had provided to me into the hands and lives of others that we are partnering with, many of which, most of which are represented among us. But you know what God did? Now when they got their hands on it, they had the opportunity to release a lot of it too because it wasn't just provision for them, it was provision for others. You see, the God who provides wants to make us an instrument of his provision. This is a part of what Abraham learned. Now, I say all this to say, when you trust the God who provides, it is not a monorail. It is a roller coaster. God teaches us in the ride what it means to trust him and what it means to look beyond just the normal and just the comfortable and really, really trust him with everything that we are. God can be trusted, ladies and gentlemen. He can be. That's why it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, these words, he who did not spare his own son. Does that sound familiar? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? You see, ladies and gentlemen, God is a God who provides and if we were in the hot air balloon watching Jesus as he was making his way to a hill around Moriah, what we would see is that there was no one coming up the other side. He is the perfect sacrifice. In Jesus, God has provided everything we need. Everything. And he can be trusted. He is a God who provides in every way. Would you bow your heads with me? We're gone in just a minute, and I'm going to give you some time to spend some time with our partners, whether you're here on this campus or our Lockport campus. 
And I, I simply want to say this. If you've never come to a place where you've turned from your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus, then when we're done, boy, if you just seek out one of our prayer partners, you could talk to one of our ministry partners. They'd be delighted to talk to you. Seek out one of our, our pastors, anybody, and just say, I need to get straight what this looks like for me to receive Jesus Christ. And do that on any of our campuses. So Father, I pray that you would teach us more and more about what it means to trust you as the God who provides. And I pray that we'd be reminded of that as we spend time with some of our partners now, trusting that you'll encourage them and that God, you would challenge us for ways in which we can connect and we can serve and we can partner together with them to see every man, woman, and child have a repeated opportunity to hear and see the gospel. So we trust you to do that now in Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask you to do this. Hold your seats for just a second. Our ministry partners, head to your tables. You can dismiss yourself and head out there so you've got a little bit of a running start on some of these folks because when they stampede out, it is scary. It is frightening, all right? So our ministry partners are making their way out. As soon as they do, here's what I wanna encourage you to do. We've gotten you out about five, eight minutes earlier. Spend some time getting to know some of them. Go around, encourage them. Maybe take an opportunity to pray for them. Learn what they're doing. Laser in so that you can figure out how you can do that on a personal basis because this is an opportunity where what we give is helping to facilitate partnerships in ministry with all of these folks. So it's a part of who we are and it's a part of who you are as well. So take opportunity to do that. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.